Good afternoon. Realise this is the last session of the day. Yay! Yay! Uh, yes! Oh, well done. Thank you. Thank you for and, and we are keeping you from beer, so let's try and make it a bit of fun, a bit of interaction. And oh, wait, I need to get them into you. And wait for you will need your something. phone. We need fun, right? You know, you, you will need your phones. We need your phones, yeah. That. So we're gonna have a little bit of a quizzy, quizzy, quizzy as well, aren't we? Or yeah, we're gonna do a little quiz. Yeah, yeah, cool, cool, cool. So um, I'm Carl Cookson. This is Chris Huntingford, and we're gonna talk about multiplexing and why it's important for everybody. I may need to present. Okay. Cool, cool, cool. Yep. Let's just move on, and then we can go from there. So. Most importantly, our sponsors, obviously Microsoft and our platinum sponsors, HSO, Docs42, PwC, Proximo3, and AIS. Couldn't do it without them. Really great, grateful for the, all the money they give us and all the support they've given us. Over, over the and a few more. Um, these are all the gold sponsors. Again, um, we're all talking about this uh, accessibly today, so that's a really important one for me. Thank you for Tiski for, for being in support there, and thank you for the rest of the guys for giving us lunch and all that sort of thing as well. Mm. Right, this is me, I'm Carl Cookson. Um, I've been doing CRM since before Microsoft stole the name and then changed it into Dynamics and all the rest of it um, in a different CRM, you know, outside of Microsoft, would you believe? Um, for quite a few years now, I'm an MVP, I'm an XRM tool, Dotbox developer, Liverpool fan, of course. And my motto, motto is don't do it twice. Cool, cool. And. <laughs> Can you stop heckling from the front? Thank yeah. you. What's up? So, yeah, my name is Chris Huntingford. Um, I actually had to look at my name to read it to you. I can't tell you why I did that. Anyway, <laughs> um, my name is Chris Huntingford. I'm Avanod's global power platform SME. So, basically, what I get to do is nerd around and talk to people about how awesome low code is. I've um, been in the partner channel. A little bit shorter than Carl. Um, Carl is the partner channel. I've only been there for like, no, since 2009, around there. And um, I like rocks and stars, so I study uh, geology and astronomy, which is quite cool. And uh, yeah, I'm a fast track recognized solution architect. If you know what that is, cool. If you don't, don't worry. And uh, yeah, I like to, my saying is uh, it's a power platform, not power app form, right? Because everyone focuses on apps. Have you copyright that? I totally should. You should. Yeah, cool, cool. Let's do it. Copyright, copyright, copyright. Okay. <laughs> Cool. So yeah, that's me. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to do a little quizzy whiz, right? So get your phones, get your laptops, find a small cat covered in cheese, don't know, do whatever you want. But um, yeah, and I'll watch you and I will present once we see some people. And if you're watching this on the video, please do scan the code, it will be hilarious. <laughs> yeah. Cool, we're getting some, some folks coming in. Oh no. Oh dear. Oh dear. Okay, has everyone scanned? Can I switch? Yep. Go ahead. Thanks, Poppet. Oh, no. There we go. Should come up. Nope. Here you go, here you go. Cool, cool, cool. Right. <laughs> <sighs> yeah, amazing. This is this is my kind of session. This is my kind of session. Whoever right. put where did it go? Super Munji. Moving around. Cole, do you want to tell me quickly about that tool you released? The, the, the data Munji, yeah. yeah. And why he got his name. Yeah, yeah. And don't, yeah. Don't, don't go to Munji on Google Dictionary. Not now, anyway. And yeah. not on a work phone, by the way. Yeah. Um, because, yes. Yeah, Munji means to bring data together in a creative way. Or something very different. Yeah. Um, Anywho. Okay, cool. So, what is your focus area? Are you Biz Apps? Are you M365? Are you Azure? Do you only do Power Platform, or do you just really want to make your customers happy? Excellent. So, most of you are wrong. Twenty percent of you are right. Twenty-five percent. Excellent. Good job. Don't change your answers. No, 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 no. Cool. All right. So, world. lots of Biz Apps. Hence, multiplexing. Phenomenal. Because that's, that's been the, around for a while. Isn't yeah, it? that's the world it lives in. Next one. What would you describe yourself as technical in IT terms? Uh, you mostly technical, my guess is, but not at all technical. Somewhere in the middle. I love code and super technical, and I can build motherboards with my. Is that you, Ivan? If you put that one, you better have. <laughs> marvelous, marvelous. All right, my friends. I'm Ooh. guessing Alison was the blue one. Yeah. <laughs> 
Okay, so for a laugh, what is this product name? Is it Common Data Service, Dataflex Pro, Project Oakdale, Dataverse, or Common Data Flexi XRM Open Service Verse? Well, he means that logo on the left, by the way. That's, that's right. Yeah. Well, he's holding the little logo. Look, he's like, like a little creature. I know, but I'm just making sure people are recognize. <laughs> and I'm pointing the screen here, which is actually no use to anyone. <laughs> oh, yeah. Okay, so, don't worry, we're nearly done. This is important. In your opinion, what is the most widely used tool in the Power Platform? Is it Power BI, Power Apps, Power Automate, Power Automate Desktop, Power Virtual Agent, or Dataverse? Ah, there we go, cool. Interesting. So, all of these are relevant in multiplexing. Every single thing you do with any of these tools you see here will have an impact on multiplexing. And don't worry, we will get to what that is shortly. Finally, uh, don't worry about that one. What is multiplexing? The name of Elon Musk's firstborn child. <laughs> Pooling connections or rerouting information to avoid paying a license. A licensing skew that is used to license a full power platform site. Cool. Well, most of you got that right. Yeah. <laughs> and for the audience. Good job. Cool. Right, and I think that's the last one. Don't worry about that. Okay, so we are going to move on to the presentation. You ready? Yeah. And smooth transition. <laughs> Literally, we, should, we should have done that a bit more prepared. Apologies for that. <laughs> so, multiplexing is not a new term, and I'm not doing anything up there. Anyway. I am, but uh, do the uh, from the current slide. Come on. There you go. Here we go. Multiplexing is not a new term. If you remember the, you know, you're as old as me, as old as Alison, you'll remember, <laughs> you'll remember that you had a phone line in your house and that phone line was shared between your neighbours at the start of all these things, wasn't it? And that was a very, very basic verb of multiplexing. You've got three users using the same bit of kit. And that evolved so that they could get more data down these uh, wires. So rather than, you know, hello operator put me through and, and the wires all swapping, they, they decided to do a lot more to do with changing the frequency of the signals that were going through so they could get the data down the lines. And that is multiplexing in, in the non-Microsoft world. And they use that all the time now, whether it's a, a, a line or a physical signal in, the, in this you know, in your area, in satellites, you know, in space, etc. It's ensuring that they can get as much data down that bit of signal wire as they can. But in Microsoft's term, they define it as when individuals use hardware or software to pull connections, reroute or indirectly access information, and or reduce the number of devices or users that directly access or use a product. Multiplexing can also include reducing the number of devices a user that product directly manages. So that's their definition. So, um, quick question. How many of you have ever looked at the Power Platform or Dynamics 365 licensing guide? How many pages are in it? No, kidding. <laughs> that's so, important for later. Yeah. And also you can, yeah. you can get a signed copy later when you, uh, tomorrow at the yeah. pub quiz. The pub so quiz. that's all getting <laughs> raffled off. So make sure you're uh, by Mr. Charles Lamarna, Charles Lamarna yeah, himself. Yeah. He's, he's got signed the we'll license. Put picture, yeah. So that's, that's pretty important. How many of you know that there is a multiplexing guide that exists directly within the licensing guide? There's a link to it. Yep, that's it. How many of you have read it? Okay. We're going to tell you some stuff today that may or may not agree 100%. So the information we've got is either from that document or directly from the product group themselves. Okay. So yeah. Um, the other thing that's important here is the multiplexing is all about data. It has got nothing to do with the app itself. It's all about data and who uses data. So obviously all of you know that um, Microsoft have got this plethora of connectors. The greatest connector actually written by somebody in the room here, Daniel Askovitz, which tells you Chuck Norris jokes. Would you put your hand up and let it run? <laughs> Very useful. Definitely not one to be blocked with DLP. So when your flow fails, you can get an email that tells you a Chuck Norris joke to make you feel better. Anyway. <laughs> but it's really important, right? So those connectors will connect out to services, yeah? So we can all agree that. So you'll have a data service on that side. 
you'll have something that happens in the front, like an app or a flow or a whatever, and that fires out to that data storage facility or data service to get information. The question I've got for you, and the question that I pose to the product group is I said, look, I'm going to be using a lot of solutions, um, and I'm going to be using a lot of data storage when uh, connecting out, but why is it that the Power Platform license has got multiplexing against it? And the biggest thing that I found out uh, from the product group is that actually the multiplexing is down to the data storage facility, not down to the license you're using, which is pretty crazy. So did you know that Salesforce has separate multiplexing rules to, da to Dataverse? Anyone know that? Yep, so Salesforce has got different multiplexing rules to Dataverse. SQL has different multiplexing rules to Dataverse. So actually across the stack, why is it that the license should be fined on the data side rather than the actual connector itself? Okay, so when we start talking to you about this, go and look it up. Actually go and look it up. Go into salesforce.com, go to their website and actually look at what they say about connectors. They have separate API call restrictions. Not every connector is treated the same way. And because of that, Dataverse is the thing that gets hit with multiplexing. That's the one that's the hard one to understand. So we're gonna make an outlandish statement later and uh, you can throw stuff at me if you want. But that is really, really key, okay? So the multiplexing is against the connector. Okay, make sense? Cool, 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 all right. So do you wanna hit the first scenario? Yes, so what we thought we'd do was, was go through some scenarios. And we've got um, Nessie and the, the Highland Cow here. And the Highland Cow is our sensible Microsoft head. And Nessie is the, the user, what they're trying to do. So what we're gonna say is, Nessie, what, Nessie wants to create an app that everyone can use. They want to pay for one license, but everyone, you know, if you imagine the number of licenses people like Tesco have for, that, for the, the, the lady that works four hours on a Saturday every week. If they wanted to give her a license for the Dataverse and all of her comrades, it, it would have been a, a very expensive. So what's the idea is, is that, that they license whatever tool she's using, license the till or, or whatever, the, whatever phone, the, the, the store phone. And that's a kiosk app in, in those terms. Mm. So, makes sense. Sounds like a good idea. Good idea for, for awesome me because it's yeah, going to yeah. be cheap, right? Rather than um, buying a license for someone that only works four hours a week, you've now got one license that can cover anyone that uses that device. But, yep, each user needs their own license per user, right? So Microsoft have been known to do uh, device-based licenses, but yep, it's a client access license. Something else that you need to understand, and oh, I might get into trouble for this. Did you know, how many of you do build your solutions based on what you read in the licensing guide all the time? Yeah, your architect, architect solutions based on what you read. Did you know the licensing guide is not a legal document? It's not, it's not a legal document. Your EA, your agreement with Microsoft is the legal part. The licensing, Guide. <laughs> it's not, so when we talk about licensing, when we talk about multiplexing, it is going to be scenario driven every time. And Microsoft will and can issue exceptions based on the agreements you have with them. Okay, so don't think you're completely locked into this stuff, right? There will be things that you can work around. And my theory, in the words of my amazing wife, everything is negotiable. Okay. So I hope that makes sense, right? Just remember, licensing guide. <laughs> you've got to make sure that if you've got a scenario where you think you, you, you want to cut the corners, you've talked to Microsoft. Yeah. Or Microsoft will, will find out and come for you. And it does depend on your relationship with them, your agreements with them, etc. Mm. But as, as they go through, they will be building your conditions and understanding of what you're doing with that app. Exactly. Chris at uh, avanard.com. <laughs> okay, wait, wait. So actually, that's a great question. It depends if, are you partner or customer? You partner, okay. You will have a, a partner channel that you can talk to, so somebody at Microsoft. There's a license, there's a license email that you can mail as well. I am gonna tell you this categorically, you will not get anything writing back from them. It doesn't happen. I used to work there, I was a partner architect. It is unlikely somebody is gonna say to you in an email, hey, do these five things and you'll be cool. They're gonna say, read page eight in the licensing guide. And um, it depends what partner you're at. If you're at a smaller boutique partner, it is a bit more hard to get information. I suggest talking to my friend Chris Parks. Um, if you are, <laughs> yeah, if you're a part of a larger partner, you will have a point of contact. Okay, but we can chat afterwards if you want and I can help you navigate that. 
So, say that again. Um, yeah, it might, it might, but that's going to be down to the agreement they have with you have with them. Okay, so you will need to get that stipulated inside the agreement. That's what I would say. Cool. And remember, the bad guy here is Dataverse. That's the one that's hard to navigate with the multiplexing piece. SQL and stuff work very differently, right? So. Yeah, we're only talking about Dataverse, really. I think the the, the crux of it is that is that we're. Like Chris said, anyone that's outside of us, we're, they've got different rules. Um, so you've got to make sure that you're, if you're going to SAP or you're going to all that, you're covering their multiplexing rules as well as Microsoft's if you're going to put that data into Dataverse. Yep. Okay, next one. I want to create a solution using the case table. Oh, wow. Oh, get in. What sort of license do we need for that? I want to create a Canvas app. You want to click, rig it up to the case table. But my friends, there is a loophole. <laughs> yeah, this is a, what they call a restricted entity. So it's a partially restricted entity yeah. now. And there's certain tables, case being one of them, the, the field service tables being the others, and the marketing, I guess, is in there as well. Yes, yeah, so there's, there's a the there, and there is a list. Yeah. We can, we, we'll point you out in a second. But the idea is that these are ones that are part of an application that they've built. So if you want to use the case table and, and use it for something uh, um, as a case table, a call, recall it, service request or whatever you want to call it, it's still a case table and that's restricted. And therefore, you can then, you can, you can think about it, well, do I use that or you create a new table over here that's called console service request and start again, that's, that's fine. Even if it is like a case, that's fine. But it's only if you use this table. So, Case table is permitted. You, you were going to go through yeah, this. Yeah. Sorry. Okay, so this is, this is a weird one. This is like a partial restricted. So just to make sure you understand, I can buy one Dynamics 365 user license. So I can buy a sales, service, customer service, uh, sales, customer service, field service, or whatever that other thing is that they call it. And um, I can install that inside my Power Platform environment. So a naked Power Platform environment, I can install that data model with one license. I can then build on top of that data model custom solutions for, a, you, for people to use from a power platform perspective on non-restricted entities, as Carlos said. However, case is a weird, weird one. Because all of us were whinging about the fact that we wanted case inside Canvas apps and we wanted to be able to build case for people to use, the reason it's partially restricted is because you can actually build an app on top, a Canvas app or a model-driven app, on top of the case entity without paying for a Dynamics 365 license if the people making or capturing the case own the case and they can only capture their things within the context of the human being. You cannot turn it into a call center. That's the whole goal. So basically they do not want you to have sharing cases or assignments. It is your case, you can use it. So a singular record, not a shared record. Yeah, and they've done that with work order as well, which is the dumbest thing. Because yeah. work, order, work order is actually not the thing that works in field service. It's the, what, the bookable resource booking, I think? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah that's the key one, isn't it? But Again, and, and there is a um, document here, when you get the slides, going to the Microsoft um, Docs site that's got a list of all the restricted tables. So there is a whole like work order and, and case and, and, and uh, quite a few others. So be careful of that, because everyone would want to create, everyone creates cases, don't they? I think it's the, the key for most establishments. Mm. So make sure that you're aware, and if you need to, use a different table. Mm -hmm. Right, this is you, I think. Yeah, this one? yeah. yeah, yeah. Your cases. Yeah. It doesn't say you can resolve Bang on. And you're not allowed to turn it into a contact center. You're absolutely, that's a really good point. So resolution means that that has now been turned into a wider type, a wider type approach for contact center. Yeah. Um, scenario driven, I would say that it's the, the, the gotcha here is that people think, oh sweet, I can make the record, but actually it doesn't do you any good. You may as well make a custom entity. That's what I found. I don't know if anyone else has got any experiences, but genuinely, the custom entity is way easier to manage. And also, I'm going to say something dodgy. Cases do come with a lot of legacy connection stuff. Yeah. Yeah. They're awful. It is a lot of stuff going on there. Go on, MCJ. So, on that, uh, if I want to create an entity for a ticket, cool. and I want yeah. to do a bunch of stuff that I would use in a case entity for ticket, that's, that's fine. Yeah. But you would have to recreate Resolve, for example. 
and, and that's the key for a lot of these things. It's just what they've built up into that product, which is customer service. Yes. Yeah. Spot on. Yeah. Cool. All right. So this is a this is my my favourite scenario of all time. This has come up more times in the world than pretty much any any, any issue. So you know we've got we've got some people doing this, right? People think about SharePoint. Daniel does a lot of dreaming about SharePoint. No, no, I've heard I've heard it's a database. Yeah. <laughs> Why? <laughs> to save so, cost. Yeah. So what happens is um, people will have data in Dynamics or Dataverse. Cool, cool, cool. Right. And uh, they think, oh, I've got, I need one Dynamics license. Then what I can do is I can fire that data over to SharePoint to build a, a solution, an app for like 5,000 users. Okay, lots and lots and lots of people do this. Yeah, this is, I would say, probably multiplexing candidate number yeah, one. Yeah, definitely. It's, mm. it's one of those core ones that we see all the time that people think we, that they can um, bypass the rules effectively. Mm. So... Sure. Yeah. So every single person, and oh no, I'm gonna, you yeah, go for it. Is it still the case you can do that as long as there's a manual step between the export and the import? Yeah, you're right. You are. You are. If someone's re-entering or doing something to that data, but it can't be mostly automatic. Mm. Personal two things. Can that manual step be a flow I've written? No, 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 no. <laughs> that's, that, and, uh, yeah, I've thought about that. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you the craziest scenario later on about that, but it's a good question. Um, so yeah, this is, this is, this is candidate number one, and um, <laughs> here's the thing. I'm gonna say something that's not necessarily in the multiplexing guide, but I've been told by the product group. So I just want to be open. Using data from DataVerse in any way, shape, or form outside of DataVerse will require a license. What I mean by using data is reading, interacting, okay? So just, under, just understand that that will require a license. The question that we get is what about if you put Power BI on top of that? Does that still count as multiplexing? Nope, it doesn't. It's a presentation. Though. That's right. It's a presentation, yeah. And that's to see if you used an email to get that data out and send it to yourself or send it to, you know, when you're sending out case things, that person at the end of the end of that email doesn't need a license, so it is it's a presentation layer. The email is that layer, mm. and it's the same with all of them. Cool. Next one. So this is a. This oh, there's is another link down there. That, that's page six of the multiplexing guide. Yeah. So. There's uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. so If you move the data out and delete it, so it's no longer in the database, it's absorbed this licensing requirement. If you move the. Yeah. I'm going to put a pin in that one. That's a, no, that's a great question though. Yeah. I've never actually had that asked. Hey, if anyone knows, but I don't know, that's a good that's question. Nice. <laughs> there will be an app and answer. It'll just be woolly as hell. Yeah. Really um, the, the other one is the transverse, which is, uh, this is the one that's controversial. Okay, and this is, the one that, this is the one that I've actually had to get Microsoft to agree to. Putting data into Dataverse in whatever way, shape, or form is fine. Input is fine. You can have input in the SharePoint list using Flow, fire that into Dataverse, and create a record. You do not need a Dataverse license for that. Okay. Um, the way that I like to explain it to people is Dataverse is a bit like a bank account, right? Like me giving you money is totally fine because they're going to charge you on consumption anyway. So they, they, they're, they're going to get the more data they have, the happier they are. Taking that data and using it outside of that is not fine. In the multiplexing guide, it does talk about input. Right, it will mention, I think it's on what, page six, it does talk about inputs. They say inputting data will require a license. That is where I've had the conflict. Because I say to Microsoft, that is not good. That's not the right way to do things. You need to be able to store the data. So actually, um, although the guide says that, every scenario I've been in, this is fine. I don't know about you, but. No, yeah, this is, this is the whole idea of, you know, you still need somehow to get that data in. Mm. But, it, you know, you could do a lot more of have, it have that flow license. You could have the um, uh, per user license or per app license to get that data in. But then it's, it's coming from all those different sources. And you could have one flow or one thing to get that data in. On that scenario, then, if you have a flow that passes stuff from SharePoint into Dataverse, which is fine, then Dataverse gives you a message back that says that was successful. That's information generated. Yeah. So that's not relational transactional data that helps a business in any way. And this is where you get into data classification. So unfortunately, that's also a good question. 
Um, unfortunately, there's no direct guideline, but I don't see, I think it's anything that is going to drive a business scenario as like being relevant or important data. I don't know, what do you think? No, no, it's, uh, you're exactly right. It is just building that, that information up and using it is where it's, and it, and it, it is what, it is a, not quite sure on that one, I think. Yeah, I would say, I would say messaging on, on success is cool. Um, the, we it depends will, what you do on, on success. If, if, you, if, yeah. you, if you're giving them an Excel spreadsheet of it all back again, then probably you would be a bit concerned. If you're just saying, yeah, it's, yeah, it's yeah, case mm. created, then maybe not. So, me again. Yeah. What about when data is dataverse synchronized from, say, business centric? Yeah, that's fine. That's Any fine. data sets. You, bear in mind what we said earlier about the, the business central's multiplexing rules. There probably is some. There will be. Um, and everything else, but you know, it, it doesn't matter where it comes from. It, this could be um, SAP, etc. On that side, it yeah. doesn't matter. They just want data. Yeah. Uh, yeah. This question, um, when we talk about the the Yeah, that's then you will need a dataverse license. They will need. For the, for the very much. That's the idea, yeah. Yep. That's right, yep. <laughs> but you see, this is, okay, so what I would do in that scenario, right, is I would go directly to Microsoft and say, here's what we're doing, all right? They, won't, they probably won't give it to you in writing. Um, and to be honest, there's not a single company in the entire world, right, that will ever, ever get somebody to pay for a Dataverse license that way. They're not going to enforce that, but you do need to know it. So if you go to them with it, they're going to be like, yeah, you do need a license. If you, there's, a, there's an email address at Microsoft called License Q. You won't be able to mail it, but internal people can. That will get pulled up as every single person needing a license. But then you negotiate. You negotiate and get it in writing that, no. that, that what you're doing is right. And, and it, it, you know, you're, a lot of these scenarios where you're building the, the, the licenses on one application versus another, that's where it gets in discussions because mm -hmm. if it wasn't for that data coming out of Dataverse, you're going to be restricted in your other ones, so you're going to reduce the number of licenses here. So it is going to be a negotiation with them. It can be. Yeah. Tom? That's a scenario for me, a. If you were shoving data into a SQL database or <laughs> yeah. data label or something like that, is that considered a presentation layer for the store there? So are you talking about not using Dataverse? So, you know, from Dataverse into, into that, data lake. some kind of backup process? No, no, that's fine. That's cool. Like, I don't, I don't see that as, if you're pushing it in, no, I don't see that being a problem. But also, so if you build on top of that, yeah, then the person yeah. needs to be licensed. You like data. No, yeah, no one needs to be licensed to be a. So on a power app, a, a Power BI on top of a data lake is a common scenario for mm. for getting it away from your transactional data and mm. using it on a you know across the whole organisation. But they, they should have a dataverse license to read that data and, and use it. Mm. The, other, the other thing I want to point out here, I'm going to cause some trouble, but. but um, that uh, over here, the little ceiling fan icon and the, the D icon. Uh, if you replace that with um, SQL, that's not multiplexing because SQL multiplexing works differently because it's server driven. So yeah, that's that's the thing. It's Dataverse that's the, the, that that causes all the the weirdness. <laughs> Is there any instrumentation <laughs> So this is why, we'll, I'll, I'll get to that at the end, but the answer is no, they don't tell you. I'm gonna, I'm gonna give you a quick one, I hope you don't mind. No, no, um, carry on. <laughs> I'm sorry, I do this all the time, yeah, yeah. I'm sorry. So there is a thing called, um, when you build, I'm, I'm gonna use this as an example to try and illustrate the point, right? There is a thing where when you build a Power App, Microsoft say you may use Power Automate in the context of the app. Okay, cool, well, what in the hell does that mean? So that means that if you're firing the flow from the app, or if the flow is fired based on data being stored in a data storage facility. So here's my thing. If I build an app that stores data in SharePoint, and then pushes data down to Dataverse, and then the flow fires, that's still in the context of the app. They have no way to report on that. So my theory is, until you can report on it and enforce it, nobody actually knows. So yeah, that's unfortunately the case. And they will start enforcing things, but multiplexing, you actually physically can't enforce. Yeah, yeah so they're starting to enforce like the graph API recently. So mm -hmm. they're making shifts to 
ensure that they're getting more and more of your hard-earned money out of, out of the, the, the user base. Okay, where were we? Four. <laughs> Portals. So you can have a portal, a power page. Is it power pages? Power pages. Like power pages. Power pages um, and you can host an internal employee, you know, reporting case, etc. In uh, on a portal. You know, we do it all the time um, to allow for scenarios where people don't want the full blown dynamics or they're disparate and not going to have etc. So. Do what do we think about the licensing here? Spot on, yeah, you're on the money. So it's that external user. It is that external user. And we've come across this now and again where we create a guest user and put them onto a portal. They're, they need a license because it, that user account is in my AD. Yeah. But it, well, if they were external and, and doing normal authentication just with um, you know, username and password on the portal, they would be classed as external. Yeah. So this, this, is a, this is a really fun one. Um, I actually did work for a customer many moons ago where <laughs> it was a bank. And what they did was they bought one Dynamics license. It wasn't Dynamics at the time. You could do this with Power Portals or whatever. And um, they basically said, we're going to buy one Dynamics license. Can you build out an internal portal for us for the 5,000 users that we have to interact? So I was like, totally, but you're going to need to pay a full Dynamics license. And there was no such thing as a restricted entity back then. So yeah, it is what it is, right? Um, the other thing is that external user, the chap at the back, they made a really great point. The concept of um, external user is literally anyone that is supporting that customer. I think you said, do you want to say what you said again earlier? Yep. So that affiliates thing. Yeah. Okay. So I'm gonna can I use I'll, I'll use retail as another example. I work in a retailer. Um, we're gonna call it Allison's Retailer. I've got 100,000 employees. Um, of those employees, 10,000 are back office, mid office employees, and the other 90,000 are people that work on the floor. Now they may not have an email address specified to that that organization. So if I take Allison's Retailer, Allison runs the business with Cookie but I am the guy that works on the floor. I don't have an email address that says chris at allisonsbusiness.com. I am an affiliate. I still need a license. In some way, shape, or form, I still have to be licensed to use that portal. And that's where it gets really tricky. Now, it's tough because this is another argument. Do you, do you negotiate Microsoft to use the portal, or would you rather actually just get them a proper login, negotiate it per user or per app license, and have at it? And then it comes down to architectural best practice. And just to be clear, I would never work with Alison. I'd, I'd end up doing all the work. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and that's in the licensing guide, guide as well, so page nine. So yeah, so what time is it? No, we've got loads of time. Oh, still. yeah. Oh. Um, so a couple of other things that, that I, think, I think need to be brought up is um, when uh, there's a couple of things around the way that Dynamics works as well. And yeah, you can read that while I, while I explain this. How many of you are using anything in Dynamics that's per app, that is not enterprise-based? So you're using the actual per app license or the app license. Okay. So it starts getting weird when you're starting to build things like Canvas apps. You can technically build another model-driven app inside that environment, but you're not allowed to. You have to pay for another Power Platform license. And if you do build it, it's considered multiplexing. There's nothing that enforces it. Microsoft can, by the way, here's the creepy thing. Microsoft can see all of the telemetry. Right? They can actually tell you even what app is broken down to the app ID. Right? So it's not that they don't know, they just don't do anything because they're, they're, they're driven by a thing called MAL, monthly active usage, okay? especially on things like Power Platform. So yeah, don't, I wouldn't necessarily, you just gotta be a bit careful about like, what you do. And um, yeah, if they, do, if they do stumble onto the fact that you've got a paid for Dynamics license on the, the per app, not attach, and uh, you are building stuff, they probably are gonna call you out on it if they see it. Does that make sense? Yeah, enterprise is fine, um, but then still, what were you talking about with the enterprise stuff within the context of the app? I don't remember. Oh. But it's, it's the, um, the whole, the, in the context of the app with a model-driven app with a Canvas app embedded, that's fine, that's not multiplexing, but as soon as you take that Canvas app out of the, the model-driven app, you need to license both. 
So there is an awful lot going on there. And an awful lot that you just need to be aware of. And I'm not saying you never should design by the licensing guide. You should design by best principles, right? Mm. But you've got to be careful and make those decisions based on costs and effectively how you're going to approach it. Is it going to, is, is that, you know, your app's been running for a couple of years. Microsoft are going to be knocking your door going, hang on a minute. Yeah. And that is all down to negotiation again. It's, it's about your, your relationship with Microsoft and how much they, they want to um, enforce mm. effectively. Yeah, and, and the other problem we found, it's not necessarily a problem, but like, because the tech is changing all the time, there's no feasible way to enforce a multiplexing with set of rules. I actually, I think when, when, we, when we're chatting about this stuff, like multiplexing plexing is actually, it is in every business, by the way. So we, whatever you are, partner or customer, I can categorically tell you it exists. There's no need to panic though. What will typically happen is that Microsoft might call you out on it, they might not, whatevs, okay. But it's all down to what I call intent. This is quite difficult to explain, mm -hmm. so I'm going to try. When you, when you implement a solution, and all of you at some point, I'm guessing, have implemented a solution of some way, in some way, shape, or form, right? Stick your hand up if you haven't. <laughs> and um, what will happen is that you'll design something. So Bjorn asked a great question around the business central piece using dataverse data. Your intent was not to screw the system, so to speak, right? Your intent was to do something really awesome. So maybe using a single user as a uh, integration point between the two, so like a, a service account or something, shifting the data against the connector, fine. But your intent was not to break the rules. And Microsoft look at that. They look at the fact that, hey, you know, your intent wasn't to break stuff, so you're not just go ahead, it's fine. You're not gonna, you know, sue the pencil for you, and they won't. But it's important to know that when you build stuff, there are certain processes, like the SharePoint to Dataverse one, that, that you will get called out on. Right, and that's a, the SharePoint, SharePoint to Dataverse. Anything that stops you buying a Power Platform license or Dynamics license, like physically stops you buying it, they will call you out on that. But if it's just about moving some data and people using another system, I can't see them. I can't see that being a problem. So ultimately, the way that um, I frame it all the time is that, first of all, talk to Microsoft. How many conversations have you had with them about this? Oh, no, you have it all the time, don't you? I think that's the point, isn't it? You're, you're designing something, and you should be asking your partners, if you're not doing it yourselves, about whether something's appropriate. And Microsoft are just trying to protect their endpoints. So that API that, you know, if, if you're causing more traffic to the API than you've been assigned effectively, that's where they're going to start getting concerned and worried and they'll start looking at what you're doing. Mm -hmm. And, it, and it's, it, it's it not just the fact that you've got a, a flow that's doing lots and lots of things and you've scheduled it for whatever, 30 seconds. It's the fact that you're, you may be causing more stress on their services than they, they're expecting from you. And that, you know, and that goes from not only you, but obviously your neighbours on, on, the, on the virtual stack that, that you're in. So if you're impacting other people, then they will start to get concerned. And making sure that they're getting their money's worth and you're, getting your, you're paying for the right things. There's, um, there's another thing as well, just on, on what you've said there. Um, I'm going to use a scenario to highlight this and actually tell you something pretty, hopefully interesting. Um, I was chatting to a certain chap in Microsoft, I'm not going to mention his name, but he does a lot of stuff with Power Automate, and I'm hoping Matt will chime in here if I'm wrong. But what we were told was that often you'll get um, a scenario where somebody, a user, you can buy a user-based flow license, so a singular user-based flow license. You know that you can basically build in integration using that flow with a single service account, right? There's nothing that's going to stop you. There is nothing to stop you. That is what you call a user-based flow. However, Microsoft built a license for that called the per flow license. You can enforce some of it, but basically when chatting to the guy from Microsoft, I said, look man, I've got this power automate. What I'm doing is I'm kind of, I'm shifting data from point A to point B. It's an enterprise, it's an enterprise interface. It's not an integration, that's a different thing. It's an enterprise interface between these two solutions. I'm shifting thousands of records. Do I have to buy a per, per flow license? The answer is yes, you do need to buy a per flow license. Does anyone ever buy a Perflow license to do that? Nope. So the answer was, hey man, we don't really care if you do that. However, you are going to get throttled. And that's what Carl was talking about. And the reason um, the throttling came in is purely because of the fact that all of us are on the same set of, set of tech. And I'm going to use the pub to highlight this. If Cookie and I and Thomas go to the pub, and I, you bring 20 bucks, you bring 10 bucks, and I drink, bring five bucks, and we all drink it's the same It's always like this, by the way. Yeah, yeah it is. <laughs> And we all drink the same amount of beer, who wins? This guy. Yeah, 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 and that's what happens. That's why there's API enforcement. Yeah, and so it's, it's, it's definitely, and it's one of those things that they will use to work out what you're doing. 
and then ask you for your solutions and look at, look at what your, your, your design to see whether the intent was to bypass a license or the intent was just to get the job done. And I think that's very key. Absolutely. So um, it, to kind of wrap this whole thing up, right, and I think, I think it's pretty important, we will open again for questions. Um, I think it's pretty important, number one, the intent is to please folks, intent, intent, intent. I always say this to people, when you see the iron brew on the table, when you see the pink cupcake on the table and you kind of feel like taking it is wrong, it probably is. Yeah, and I'm, I'm the culprit of that, I promise you, I've done it thousands of times. The documentation is there, it, but in my opinion, controversial point of view, I think it's vague. At least they've got something in it, but they can't cater for every scenario. And if you run into multiplexing scenarios, I, I'm going to shoot myself in the foot for this, if you run into multiplexing scenarios, get hold of us because we can actually fire it up the chain or just chat about it on social. Um, I can't guarantee you support will happen 24 seven, but what I can say is that if you do run to get stuck, personally, I love it. So I like trying to figure out the problem. But I, I, no, I look, yeah, it's the same. It's, we, we have got interactions with the product and we've asked them these questions quite a few of the times. And it's, it's making sure that they understand what we're trying to do. And that's always been Microsoft's problem, hasn't it? It's the fact that they don't know how to use their apps. No. They can build a great app, but they don't see it in the real world. And that's what customers and partners are there. And that's why you, know, you have that chain up to the product to tell them that these things exist. I think, that, yeah. The, the, per, the, sample, what's the sampling license called? The Energy Code. Energy Code is, is a great one. They bought this thing out, which, which sounds great, right? But without any control of it, someone can go and find some apps in the repository and, and click on lots of that apps, like when you first join it, and just clicking around and you just got all these And that's a tenor every time. And they're just like, oh, we didn't think of anything like that. And it's like, okay. So this is where we need to think back as a community to them to make sure that we're there, they're delivering the service that we're, we're expecting. Absolutely. So that's pretty much it from us. Um, you know, we try to, we can't hit every scenario. There's no way there's a silver bullet out of this. But I thought we'd bring up some of the common ones that, that come out all the time. Um, yeah, there are some very smart people in this room as well that um, would be able to come bring up some really good integration scenarios, I suppose, that would help to collaborate on this. But right now, that's what we got for us. So thank you very much, Brooks. Yeah, so just thank you again to our sponsors. Yeah. All the guys here, maybe not Fox and Oakley this time. <laughs> and then uh, and these guys have got a lot of sponsors. Well, have you got any, got, any, got any questions, any further scenarios that you could think of that we can come across? Yeah, if I just on internal users, any options for external users in the portal? For portal? Right. Yeah, no, so you're typically okay. The thing that they've modeled you on that is the logins. So I can't remember the exact scenario, but it says in a certain period of time, like the actual login to yeah, it's, sites, it's but there's no real Login for a day per, per user, isn't it? Yeah. Okay. And it's also the fact that you need, you still need to start it off with and uh, the base per month, per page license. And this is a custom portal. Yeah. yeah. Oh, the custom portal is not on power pages. Oh, that's yeah. an awesome one. Oh, yeah. please, please, we can do this one. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, we're fine. I promise I'm going to try and make this as quick as I can. Um, ultimately, many moons ago, when they released power, power portals, or I don't know, power putting in the form of now. And um, yeah, yeah. And basically, I was I, I logged a query with Microsoft just to be able to the Microsoft in the room. So um, I logged a query saying that I want to use a site core data structure on top of um, D365. And I said I'm not going to use portals, and they told me that was multiplexing. And I said that is nonsense because there is no feasible way that people like the portal connector, site core, um, all of those folks are multiplexing. So in my theory, and this is my opinion, built to your heart's content. Chuck it onto data versus next to a bunch of users access and information on constant. But yeah, if it's the same with the normal portals, it's that external user. If you put the site the same thing in with internal users doing it, yeah. then that would be multiplexing and you would get caught out of it. Yeah. So it's whether whether it's cycle or whether it's power pages, it's the same deal. Cool. So there's an argument that says you should license it the same as you license power portals. So I agree. But I don't. I don't. Agree, well, I agree with the concept, but I don't agree with the practice. I would. I would not. Person, that's just me, folks. By the way, my opinion. Yeah. It's it's a tricky one, but I think I think yeah. It's, it's any of those apps that are using the data outside. You know, there's lots of connectors that go outside, and they're basically 
they're classing them as, as the, the visualization plane. So when you take your data and you spit it out to Twitter, that's the visualization plane, and that's okay. But it's that link back to it that's the problem. Cool. Cool. Come on the back, yeah. Uh, a couple of quick points. I think I hear what you're saying about intent, but I think I think we probably all say that sometimes it's very difficult to distinguish intent from one person's trying to screw the system Sorry. and another person is trying to just find an innovative, cost-effective way to work within licensing mm -hmm. guidelines. And that that's probably the, the kind of difficult way to still try and balance. It, yeah. yeah, and that's the woolly bit, and that's why it's vague yeah. because they, they they want you to have a conversation with them. The other, the other one is your scenario 3 I'm still having difficulty with it, to be honest. I mean, it honestly feels like my software overstepping the mark, especially if you're exporting your data out with the Microsoft ecosystem. Frankly, what the hell is it going to do with Microsoft at that point? Uh, I think so. So that's a great question. Um, I, I'm, I'm, we can chat about that afterwards but a bit more. But ultimately, what I think there is that because the data is generated in the dataverse and that's the engine, yeah. they want somebody to pay for it. And yeah, it actually, there's a paragraph in the multiplex about it, in front of me that actually says it, that physically says they need to use it. But there are anomalies around exports. So if you're doing automation, like, you know, capture a record here, fire it as a flow, yeah, that's a license. But say as an example, if you've got a batch process running in the evening that batches records from point A in database to point B and somewhere else, you're right, it is not part of it. And that's where the wooden part is. So the flow one I know is categorically multiplexing. The batch transfer one, like integration, like you all were saying. What's your data lake or whatever? Yeah. That's that's where it gets a bit tricky. There's another one at the back as well. Yeah, I just so if you have like a dynamic smart dynamic licenses, and for example, uh, per app license for the user, you for the user. So only restriction is the restricted entity. Because I'm always confused when I'm really part of the license back. So I'm okay with for example, you have a sales process and you have a total custom process that cannot connect to that, mm -hmm. but it's not sales. And it's okay on the same on the dynamics market. Do you use a clear up? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, you, you, they, they like the idea of bringing all your data together. So, that, you know, a lot of the things that we've got are building on that core, and that's what the idea of it, isn't it? Maybe you're building that application. But, but, but you can have different sets okay. of users on that one. Database, but they all have to be licensed for what they're using. But when you read the licensing guide, I haven't read it for the last version, there's like this table, you know, they have the. Yeah. And the table says, you know, we have per app, we have database, it doesn't have says dynamics. So it always confuses me so it works. They have the certain entities, but I'm not sure if it's like 100% or is it working because the tenant, the tenant was spun up, was spun up one time ago, or I'm always yeah. confused with that. Or even maybe that's what it was in units. It's a different thing for a different customer. Yeah. So it's almost confused. Yeah. So we're going to test it. One customer, it works. And we're going to have a customer or something. So I'm not sure. So I'm just going to press it. That's hard. Yeah. I mean, that's a tough one. I genuinely don't know how to answer it. Yeah. What we should do is drink a ton of beer and battle it out. No. Why is this flow getting throttled so bad? 
So it's not as if they're going to come and hunt you down, but it's just important the architecture that you understand what we're talking about. Just let you know, right? Better the devil you know than the angel you don't know. That's the theory. So, so based on the analysis of the campaign? Yeah. Uh, well said, by the way. I got it. Oh, so you can move, oh, I don't like because you get a lot of grandfather and stuff, don't you? Well, it changes that amount. Yeah. So if I write something this month, yeah. it in the guidelines, and in two, three months' time, the bag changes, which version applies? You have that applies to the time of the operator and the license purchase. That is a good question. I'm sure we had this conversation before. Um, but, yeah. yeah. And actually, this is the check of the bag. It's kind of, it's, the, the Chris is saying it's quite right, but it applies to the time of purchase, right? So when you purchase the, the, the license, that's effectively the guide you're using. Solution architecture build, like the build, you can't really prove the date, but you'll have documentation that does it. But yeah, they're going to change stuff all the time. I mean, remember when they had 5,000 API, or 1,000 API calls and random shots of fire? Remember when API calls were introduced? Everyone was like, okay. So this, it's just going to be the same continuous but, thing. No, no, but it's, it's the same with that, is it? That they've now got ways of monitoring API calls and you know them, and I think this is going to be the same. That when they try and tighten their belt by ensuring that they're getting the most out of out of you as possible and doing the right thing, yeah. they'll start producing the metrics. Or and internally, and then maybe get it out to you. Yeah. yeah. And, and I definitely think, like Greg and I, I definitely think that they should have like proper forums for this stuff. Mm. They, the multiplexing demon came out many years ago and everyone was like, oh my gosh, multiplexing. Now it's like not a normal thing to chat around. So. Uh, questions to, to the scenario. When we have to the table, to another table. To, no, for example, to business central or shareholder. Does the person who sees the data from the restricted table in the other system needs, uh, for example, I don't know, customer service or people license? That's or right, yeah. it's enough to say you get the power of the app license because then he has a license? So if it was his cases, but I doubt it would be his cases only, we could do it with a powerhouse license. But yeah. other, other than that, you would need a full head for customer service. Yeah. And that's why, it, you know, most scenarios, if you're not using the full SLAs and, and resolution part of the case, we don't touch it. We, we sort of go to a different, you know, build your own. Because it, it's only worth it when you've got all that built in stuff that you want to use. And basically, they say they don't care how many gates are in the way. The origin of the engine's database. Who cares how many stage gates there are? They said that the end product you still need to have a license. But to Matt's point, again, you know, it depends on what's actually been done with the data, and that's going to be down to solution design and again intent. Yeah, just, uh, so we, I, I like the customers we have, and I Yeah, yeah, but it's, it's basically, uh, it's, it's, I call it micro case management. It's like you don't need all the resolution and SLAs. Yeah. Yeah. But given the fact that the, the opportunity and keys are still on the tenant, is not giving people permissions to, to case an opportunity enough to yeah. run a power apps license? Yeah. Or would they still need a dynamic license for the dynamic, as a dynamic app on the tenant? You don't, you don't need, no, you, the users won't need, if you're looking at one that's been around for a while, you're still trying to look at the intent of that person. Like we were saying earlier, where you've got a CRM system with case and everything else on it, if that user isn't using case, they can have a normal license. It's that user intent. And if you restrict it, or you don't show it at all, then that's fine. Because like we, we work through a lot of scenarios where, where they're doing opportunities and sales, but they can log their own cases for support. And that's that's fine because it's their own case. But they can't see the wider scope of it. I thought, I thought Microsoft were going to put tools in place that you couldn't access a dynamic they, tenant without a dynamic license. Yeah, I, I, can't, I don't know if it's been enforced yet. I don't think it is. I think it may come. I reckon it will. I absolutely think so. I think they'll stop like, really, really. But really I think they'll shoot themselves in the foot. Yeah, you know, yeah you know, remember, remember when they did that stuff to T member? Yeah. Oh <laughs> man, that was a quality experience. That was. Um, anyway, we've got um, a minute. We should wrap up. Yeah, we should. We should go. We'll we'll let you get to the pub. So, uh, thank you very much, everybody. Um, thank you for your time and your attendance.